a bit of background that in, in, in very few words, let me try to restate what I see as how we got to where we are. Uh, I think it started with the lawyers who submitted some petitions to the government, hoping government to react. And the first signals were emitted sometime around April, May, when they started writing letters to the government with petitions. And deadlines were given that were not met, nothing was done, and finally the lawyers uh, decided to boycott the course. Then came in the teachers, who had their own grievances and they tabled them to the government. And they thought the government did not pay attention to their grievances. And so they too decided to boycott, boycott the classrooms. Then it escalated when I think the first escalation in Bamina was on the 21st of November, when there was confrontation between the forces of law and order and, and the civilians. And it got worse at the time when, uh, with the BBC Mancho issue, when, that's when the conflict took a different dimension, when the population now came in. And their grievances were about the condition of the roads in Bamenda, about the problems that they are facing on employment in the country. And so it escalated and aggravated. Now, to me, this is the grosso mundo, the, the bedrock, the, the immediate causes of the, the conflict. We may have many, many remote causes. Then the question I ask is, what role has the media played so far? I support it to my observation. Uh, some media houses have tried to avoid the conflict. Some refuse to talk about it for quite some time until when things really escalated and these media houses were almost compelled to say something about it. Others were part of it from its inception, from when the first signals were sent out by the lawyers. Now, how have we, the, the media, has been reporting? In my opinion, we have been, to a large extent, partisan. Either for or against. There are media houses that have been for the government opinion. And there are media houses that have been for the, the street person's opinion. And now the position that we have taken now, if you look at the, the younger generation, I can speak for Cameroon and they apply for a larger part of the world. But the younger generation, they go more on online news, on the internet, on WhatsApp, on Facebook. They trust more what they read from there. And few of them go to the newspaper. The older generation, they go to the newspaper and the middle age generation. But the younger ones, who are the ones on the front line of what is happening presently, are mostly on the internet, on the net. And if we look at what the internet has been reporting about this conflict, it has been to a large extent in St. Diego. It is, in some of the cases, us against them. Now the challenge that we face as media practitioners is that everybody is a journalist on the internet. That everybody reports what they want to report, the way they want to report it, and when they want to report it. The happening now syndrome has swept the internet. And the problem and challenge we have as practitioners is how to reclaim and redefine the right position. But unfortunately, some journalists, I put on quotes, follow the trend of the street reporter who report out of emotion and the position they have taken. Uh, I've followed some journalists on as out of the country, but they are, I know they are trained journalists out of the country. And you, you would hear phrases like the, the blood-sucking regime. Now, coming from the journalists who are taking the side, you are not reporting the facts of what has happened. You are interpreting the facts and now giving your opinion to the public. Now, what is my responsibility as a journalist? Is to report what has happened. 
what I have seen, what I have heard. Now, in spite of my emotion, in spite of how I feel, that I don't extend my own interpretation to the public. I don't extend my own feelings to the public. Let them themselves read the facts the way they are. And let them interpret the facts the way they are. And so my worry in the present circumstance is positions that have been taken. And to, to be honest, there are a few persons, a few journalists, who have maintained the objectivity. And they are hitting the point right through. Perhaps I'd rather end here and we may come back again later on. Okay, thank you very much. Hope so you would rather tend to the opinion that we have currently a more tending uh, coverage to war journalism here, where journalists may be uh, subject to the personal opinion and rather to objectivity. Uh, Madame Oman, from your perspective as a long-serving civil society uh, worker, and you know the, uh, the, the media landscape quite well, because you were also working uh, with the Friedrich Ebert Foundation on the media barometer in Cameroon. What is your uh, current uh, assessment? What do you think is the role of the media current in the current conflict situation? Thank you very much, uh, Alex. I think, uh, first of all, uh, I wish to thank you and uh, your team for taking this initiative at this period in the life of this country where we need dialogue platforms, where we need people to come together, put their heads together in order to see how we can enhance or promote the dialogue of peace for just outcomes in seeking solutions for the prevailing, uh, for the prevailing situation. I will first of all say that when we talk about freedom of expression, Freedom of expression is the core of a healthy media, fundamental human right, and vital for the democratic structure. If we have this in mind, I as a person, then you as a journalist, we will then find common grounds and see how to put our problems in one basket and see how to come out of that basket with the positive solutions. The Reverend has just given us an overview of what has been the talk of the day in the uh, recent, uh, in the past weeks, in the two regions of English speaking, uh, of English speaking origin, that is the Northwest and Southwest. There is one which may be forgot uh, to mention. Uh, the crisis which we all mentioned uh, witnessed here at the University of Boya, where students went in for a peaceful protest, which resulted to all to what we saw in terms of brutality, dehumanizing people's rights, and the leading, you know, to frustrated minds and, uh, 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 and, and what we, we, we got. In every country, in every community, we always have problems. We always have issues to debate or discuss, you know, to look at, in order to make us live in harmony. But when these issues or problems are not looked into seriously, they now escalate into what we call conflict, which we have seen today. And when this happened, <coughs> what was the rule of what is the rule of media? in all of what we witness on this one. I will say that uh, from a general perspective, the journalists did just their job. From a general perspective, they did just their job of informing the population that we are about updating us minute by minute about what was happening. But when things went wrong is when interpretation as a reverend said when people began interpreting when journalists began interpreting being, uh, being led by their own you know emotions and passions you know interpreting beyond what they're supposed to do not having a, a, a 
uh, uh, they did not have an agenda setting, you know, effect from the very beginning of all what we witnessed. If there was a, an agenda that was set, you know, to, to follow up what was happening, then there would, wouldn't have been deviations. But I would also say that we should know that we are in a do democratic situation, democratic era. And you have people who deviate the cause of justice in for personal gains. And yet today in Cameroon, we talk about Gombo journalists, in quote, Gombo journalists, who will follow propaganda, you know, and that to favor government or the opponent because they have if, because they have something to gain at the tail end from it. The role of journalists, the role of media in promoting peace, and with regards to what we have seen, is to give us information. Because us, the masses that we are, we are not there at the scene when those things happen. What we need is to be educated, you know, on how to go about what we are doing, what we are about doing, or what we are doing. To be educated on how to carry on our protests, on how to strike, you know, so as not to escalate into violent conflict, like what uh, we saw. The role of journalists and or the media is to play diplomacy, as you say, is to play diplomacy. Seeing it but moderating the tone. This is what I think for the beginning, uh, because we have more to talk about, and, uh, 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 is the role of journalists. They gave us information, yes, but there was deviation somewhere, there was propaganda somewhere, which led to uh, so many other brutalities that we witnessed or we saw in our communities. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I, I think you, you said one, one key thing, uh, which I, I, I want uh, Wolfram maybe to elaborate a little bit on, uh, because the media is here to inform and be diplomat how to um, organize non-violent, peaceful uh, resistance. So, what, Wolfram, what do you think, what, what role can uh, media play in this kind of uh, situation? Because, just to explain, because you, you are here the expert of conflict transformation and also can maybe give us a broader view on what can be roles of different conflict parties. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, Danny. Um, from the viewpoint of, uh, of uh, conflict trans uh, facilitation and conflict uh, transformation, I have a little bit different view because I'm not really, uh, I must admit, not so much into the media landscape in Cameroon. I've been here for a year now, so it's difficult. There's very many media houses and types uh, of media, so I'm, I'm not so, I also have two small children, they need a lot of time, so there's not too much time to read the newspapers or watch television. Um, but uh, I can say that, that conflicts uh, in general, they start in the minds of men. Yeah? Uh, it is therefore, men and women, it's therefore um, important to know how they get into the minds. Uh, so by large, uh, we, 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 I think that we are what we, what we eat uh, and we think uh, what we read, actually. So um, that is what we hear on the radio and in, in television. Uh, media plays a very uh, important role uh, in spreading images of threats and um, animosity images of the other, so we, we always divide into uh, them and we. Um, so large, large scale conflicts mostly involve people we do, not, we do not even know, actually. So we're talking about them, but we don't know what they really want, what are their needs, uh, what are their feelings. Um, Media play a, a crucial role actually in, in, in the escalation of conflicts. They can escalate the conflict, but they can also they, they have the power to, to de-escalate conflicts. Uh, what we also what I discover is um, or see is that media is mostly in the hands of the powerful. Actually, the power the powerful the elites they are not really interested in in changing the status quo or they want to distract from what they're actually doing. 
Uh, so if if I uh, if I invent uh, the, the narrative of of um, me against them, of Anglophones against Francophones, then I distract from my own responsibility as a government. So um, I can use the media to distract people from what they are protesting. And, and, and in the course of the conflict, at some point they don't even sometimes really, uh, it's not even clear about what they are protesting anymore because it started somewhere, violence is being added, the conflict uh, comes, evolves to a next stage, more violence is added, more animosities, and uh, the original uh, issue of the conflict has changed. So these, these things add up to escalation, and in the end, it's just a very confusing stage where we all go to, uh, into the others together, actually. So, um, we should, as a journalist, um, um, my recommendation was to always keep in mind that there is there was an original issue of a conflict, and there is also in different stages there is also different issues. And actually, a conflict is not about the people; it's not against we and them. And that everybody has his ideas, his wishes, his needs, um, and in order, and everybody wants these needs to be met. So it is about something and not about someone. And that is actually the important thing. It's not about Hutus and Tutsis and Anglophones and Francophones, but it can evolve into this. And if we lose um, the issue, and as a reporter, we should always report about this conflict issue in the end. Okay, thank you. I think that will be also now the next step uh, where we will involve the discussion. But uh, still, uh, Mr. Kuhn, you as the president, uh, of the Southwest chapter of the Cameroon Journalist Trade Union. What would you say, what is the role of the media in the current conflict? Is it an information provider, watchdog, gatekeeper? What, what is your idea in you? Well, uh, when I received a call from you to do a presentation, I, it was from the backdrop that they received a consortium of journalism associations operating in the Southwest region. And from what I've gathered so far, it seems as if uh, there are accusations on uh, the practice of journalists uh, who are described as irresponsible. But I want to, if you permit, I want to present the situation on how the journalists in the Southwest region have been covering this event. We will come to this point. Okay, we'll come to I that. just want to have an, an introductory statement of you. What you, in your position as uh, spokesperson of the consortium and as the president of the Cameroon uh, Journalist Trade Union Southwest chapter thing. What is the role of the uh, of the media in the current conflict situation? Well, the role of the media is to inform objectively and to an extent uh, just give the population what information is required. It is true we have to be cautious at times not to escalate um, the current situation beyond proportion. But I think we are just supposed to present the facts the way they are. And uh, we must be courageous because we must understand that we are operating in a political environment that do not want journalists to give the information the way they are. So as journalists in the present circumstances, we are supposed to be very courageous. We are supposed to to find certain parts. If not, we are not going to tell the story from where uh, the actions are taking place. We are going to rather get information from media organs that are in Yaoundé and Juwala reporting what is happening in the Southwest region. Okay. I think you already go into the, my actual next question, which is also related to you, which is about the uh, media landscape here. Because you and also other uh, organs, journalist organs, I would say, are published together on the 11th of December uh, press release uh, on, um, you say, the, the, the marginalization of the, lang of the English language. You used another term for this, which uh, for me is a quite a journalistic uh, expression. So I say it's about the, the marginalization uh, during, especially. Uh, that governmental documents are not being translated, 
especially during press conferences, workshops, seminars, etc. And if this practice is not being changed, you say that this that the media should boycott these events and uh, have a media blackout. So can you just now describe how is the situation in the Anglophone uh, region which led to this Consequences. That's what I wanted to present to give you a picture. Okay. I wanted us to really understand what is happening in the southwest region as far as media coverage is concerned. So that it gives it paints a picture before we get to where we are. Before it takes okay, a that, that was my question now. Okay. Can I go on with this? Please. Okay. Now uh journalists in I'm presenting a picture, please. One this picture. Okay, yeah. Journalists in the Southwest region have been keen observers and reporters of all that has been happening in the Northwest and Southwest regions of the country for more than a year now. The Bermuda Conference in 2015 by common law lawyers was highly followed and reported by media organs, noting the different, the different grievances expressed by lawyers as some of them were guests on our different media platforms to explain the content of their memo to government. Eight months later, when they reconvened in Boya for the same purpose, the media in the Southwest region also provided the same intensity of media coverage to the conference, with same grievances expressed, with same grievances expressed to the government on the plight of common law lawyers in Cameroon. When the lawyers declared a four-day strike action in 2016, because the government had refused addressing their worries, all media organs in the region reported a strike move with objectivity, clarity, and elaborately. All the actions by these lawyers in Bermuda and Boya have received unprecedented radio, print, and TV coverage from media outlets in the Southwest region. The strike action by teachers and Northwest, by teachers of the Northwest and Southwest regions has equally been given sound and in-depth coverage by journalists in the Southwest region, with, with explanations from key stakeholders featuring as guests on our different media platforms. This same trend of media coverage followed the demonstrations in Bermuda, Kumba, Kumbu, etc. with heavy human and material losses, University of Boya's students' demonstrations, the SDF and CPDM rallies in Boya. As we covered and are still covering the strike actions by both the common law lawyers and teachers of the Northwest and Southwest regions, our observations from credible sources across the different spheres that make up the two regions present the existence of many other problems in the regions that go beyond the express worries of the lawyers and teachers that could easily explain the riots in Bermuda, Kumba and Kumbu. We discovered that there was an overwhelming express and phone problem. Many of those we spoke to, us, we spoke to gave us the impression that the two regions of English expressions in the country have been systematically marginalized in different domains. They express the feeling that there seems to be a scheme put in place by the government to wipe out one culture and identity in favor of a dominant French culture. However, we also noted through some of the elites we spoke to that the government is genuine, taking care of the two English-speaking regions like it does for the eight other regions. To them, there is no reason to get alarmed because the government has always worked to ensure national unity and integration. Government's reactions to the present grievances by the teachers and lawyers are equally given keen attention and analyzed on our different media outlets and platforms. The outings by the Minister of Communication, Higher Education, Justice and Keepers of the Seal, the Prime Minister, uh, the Prime Minister and efforts by the created committees to listen to the teachers are always reported to our listeners, readers and televiewers for a better understanding of government's reactions and treatment of the grievances. However, we, we also observed that some of the grievances expressed by the teachers and lawyers had a semblance to what we as journalists in the region have been suffering from. Many journalists in the region find it difficult to make sense out of most documents that are distributed as press kits, amongst others, in most government-organized events, workshops, and seminars, since they are produced in, in the French language. Most of the facilitators in such events carry on in French, and as such, makes it difficult for journalists who do not understand the French language to write properly and present objective uh, reports. As if that is not enough, 
We also noticed that media outfits located in Yaoundé and Douala are in, in the French-speaking parts of the country are always given priority and preferential treatment in all official events organized in the Southwest region over the regional-based media outfits. I'm talking about the local uh, media events. This was very visible during the celebration of the 50th anniversary celebration of the reunification of Cameroon that took place in Boya two years ago. The just ended female football nations uh, cup that was organized in Limbe and the annual Mount Cameroon Race of Hope that is an annual event that takes place every year in Boya. We discovered that media organs located in Yaoundé and Douala are given priority over this event. As if that was not enough, the regional delegate of communication for the Southwest region on the 1st of December issued a communique. There is a copy that I have here addressed to owners of private radio and TV stations in the Southwest region to stop all roundtable discussions in their respective networks in the Southwest region on the current political atmosphere in the Southwest region. We all saw this move by the administration as a massive violation of our rights to inform our publics and also a slap on the face of the people of the Southwest region who by this community were, were going to be deprived, deprived their right to real-time and credible information. Our silence to, to all of the above outlined factors would signal a grave threat to the practice of journalism and its existence in the region because all indications were pointing towards a situation where journalism practice in the region could one day be asphyxiated in favor of media organs in the French-speaking parts of the country so that they could only tell the stories as desired by the administration. It is from this backdrop and the need to see our profession better respect, respected and given attention that the different journalism associations operating in the Southwest region organize themselves and propose a need for a journalism consortium so that they can pull their weights and pressure and pull their weights together and pressure the authorities and other institutions for their voices to be heard and their rights respected. Threatened in different ways, directly and indirectly, journalists from four different associations in the Southwest region met on Sunday the, the 11th of December in Boya to discuss the above cited issues and to seek a way forward that would guarantee the survival of the profession in an increasingly hostile environment. After hours of frank discussions, the journalists resolved to create a consortium of journalism associations operating within the region, which will serve as an umbrella platform to resist draconian moves by the government to amputate journalism practice in the region and press for the rights of journalists to be respected. The consortium has been created. The, there is a copy of the community you're talking about. I have a copy here. So the consortium now exists and is going to work to pressure government, to pressure administration to give us the right, leave us to do our job the way we do our fit in, in the interest of the people who have the right to information. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Fu, uh, for this uh, elaborate uh, kind of status quo we have now for the journalist part. Um, Reverend Bukoko, you're, you're not solely the National Communication Secretary of the PCC, but you're also uh, the station manager of the CBS radio. Uh, what do you think in your, in your everyday practice you see? What, what are the key roles of journalists they should now follow in this situation of conflict? Well, just, just before I get to that, just uh, one more about uh, I heard that the government banned the consortium. Has it been legalized finally? No, the government, the government did not ban it. The government, you know, after we sent out the information, we were called by the regional delegator of communication who told us that the governor called her and that he was very worried about what is happening. But the governor himself has, uh, is really very, according to what she told us, the governor, the governor is just very worried They're not banning the Yeah, this is, this is it. <laughs> Yes, please, yes. That's what he was asking. Yeah, because that's another issue again about the, the, the government interference in uh, yeah. communication norms in trying to direct what we report and what we don't report. Which, again, that's another issue can be handled differently. I think the Alice will now go and leave later on about what is the situation where the government is trying to intervene in the rights of the journalists, what we should do. Because 
It's our responsibility to report the facts the way they are. <coughs> the government will be worried if we don't report the facts. Now, coming back about the gathering. And I think, I just think it's also, as we are gathering now like this, I think it's, it's uh, also I think an important fact uh, if this is uh, uh, valid information or if this uh, is applying also to this kind of events we are organizing here. I think. But still, I think that's something we need to deal afterwards with. No, but let, let me make one, one, one last remark on this. One last remark. We ended with uh, saying that um, we, uh, the consortium has been created and we intend to pressure our administration to fight, fight back any time our rights are threatened. We all staged, we staged a consortium, staged a move to the regional delegate of communi communication last week, asking her to uplift her stop on roundtable discussions on, on the current crisis. She succumbed to our pressure, called on us to go ahead with our programs with moderation. So we went there and she said we can go. Okay, good, thank you. Well, let me go to, to the system you asked about what, what I think should be the posture of the journalist in the current situation. Uh, I think it should be that of objectivity. As an individual, I have a right to my opinion and a right to my interpretation of facts. But I should not project that opinion and interpretation to the public. Secondly, is to give a balanced coverage. And even if I'm reporting about the strife of the lawyers in the Anglophone sector, I should also give the government the ability to explain, the latitude to explain themselves out. And take, for example, the, the, the lawyers or say the teachers in the Southwest are on strike. At least I should approach the regional delegates of uh, education or basic education to find out what is the government doing. And if he refuses to respond to my questions, I put it very clearly in my report that I approached the regional delegate and he refused any response. And it's, it's not only about projecting the position of the, the teachers or the lawyers, we should also seek the way of what is the government, what is the government saying about this, that we confront with him against the other. But also go beyond that to seek the, the common man's position well, what is the impact of all of this on the common man in the streets? The one who is not a lawyer, he is not a teacher, what is the person's opinion about this? How does it impact that person? So we shift the kit for that. And thirdly, when I report the conflict, at the end I should be able to ask myself, what could be the way out? I should be able to suggest either to the lawyers or to the government, what from what has been presented could be a peaceful resolution to this particular situation. Then I would have done justice to the cause that is going on, but also to my profession as a journalist, and also pushing forth the uh, peace journalism issues. Um, you want to add something here? Maybe just before she has just, uh, at the beginning I tried to make a difference between online uh, reporting and uh, the script writing. We, we comment the, the newspapers, what are they doing so far about, at least when it concerns issues of the extreme negativity. Newspapers is torn down a lot because perhaps of serious editing that goes on. But online is where we have the greatest challenge. That how do we handle the online issues? How do we address them? Okay. Madam Wong, I also know that you are a member of the Southwest Civil Society Organizations Network and you're on the board as well here. Um, and also this organization, this network, also published on the 16th of December a press release uh, demanding that all conflict stakeholders should restrain from violent actions and uh, uh, a solution-oriented dialogue platform should be established. Can you please give us an idea of how this dialogue platform should look like, or how it should be established? What are the key components here you have in this press release? The reason why we talk about non-violent nations for so long is because we, after seeing all what happened, the least need now for us to rethink the approaches used and then to go into community building. Not only the media, not only civil society, but also uh, government. And uh, when we talk about uh, Build, rebuilding, 
our communities in the case of the Northwest, in the case of the Southwest of some of the areas like Kumba and so on. It is because we saw a situation, first of all, where unarmed masses confront people who are heavily armed and sent by government, you know, to stop them from expressing their grievances. And this led to a good number of our brothers and sisters losing their lives. So we are saying that there is no need for that. If there is no need for that, if we can identify what the issues are, can identify it around a common platform, let us identify our, a common platform, come into it, you know, all the stakeholders. Now when we talk about all the stakeholders, we're talking about the key players. Who are these key players? You have the government bench. You have the leaders who were leading, you know, the peaceful demonstrations that escalated into what we saw. You have the media. You have civil society. You have religious authorities like our reverend we sit here, for example, uh, 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 with us. This is what we mean that uh, government should not give a deaf ear. And we do not want to hear about the uh, preconditions being given to people in a situation where people uh, are expressing what they feel is a situation which keeps them uneasy. It is even to the advantage even of the government to let that people are expressing their grievances. But now, the question we could also ask is how are they expressing it? If they were expressing it in a violent manner, then we condemn them. But if they are expressing it, their grievances, in a peaceful manner, then the government, for instance, comes in to disrupt the peaceful protest, then there is a problem of one party not wanting uh, a dialogue. Like what we heard now in the communique or the statement, press release, which the journalists uh, made, that uh, they were denied the right to round table, to a round table uh, conference. And I think these are the dialogue platforms we need for government to be able to grasp what the real situation is. And if government cannot uh, open up to this, then we, we, we are going to a situation of, and we say doom, and we are not ready to receive that. Our communities are not ready to receive that. So we want a multi-stakeholder. We want a multi-stakeholder platform where people will express themselves peacefully around a common table, like brothers and sisters looking at ourselves on the faces, and government getting lessons, learning from this, learning from this uh, 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 peaceful platform, and trying to get a, a, to set an agenda, a roadmap on what to do in order to address the current situation. That is our position. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Menzi, what would you say from a conflict transformation perspective on this idea? Um, first of all, yeah, I agree that um, it's, it's already, it has, to a certain extent, it has already um, escalated the conflict. And um, we would say what, what is a uh, Gandhi said, Satyaka, the, uh, the nonviolent resistance, has already taken place when the journalists are going to boycott. So it's already the uh, second stage, more or less. Um, we're coming out of, of peaceful demonstrations, negotiations maybe, but this has all not was all fruitful. So now um, we already have a, a further escalation. Um, and I think it's, it's the right way to, 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 uh, to act in a, a non-violent, resistant uh, protest form. What, what would you suggest if, for example, in, in, this, in this consortium, in this platform, it's rather a platform, uh -huh. uh, one of the partners uh, is pulling out? What um, is the possibility then here for the civil society, for the media, to still uh, enhance or, or put the pressure? As I said, when somebody is pulling out and not reacting at all, I think it's the right way to, to use non-violent protest in order to um, to force um, the government, which is uh, or the, the party who is not taking part in the, in the dialogue, to get back to the table. And this this needs actually it needs courage. Eh? It's, uh, it also. Um, can uh, cause some victims in this case, but, but violent protests will uh, cause more victims uh, than this. 
the churches want to act on what they say about some if somebody pulls out, you know, uh, around the table of negotiation, that's also a, a, a form of expression. That's also a, a form of communicating, of expressing him or herself. So it is left for the rest of the other stakeholders to find out why he is pulling out <coughs> and to, to 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 put up strategies or or, 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 or come up with mechanisms that will ensure that that particular person who is pulling out is brought back on board. That is what I, I have to add. Okay. And now back to the, now I address you as the spokesman of the consortium. Uh, would be this kind of collaboration also in the, in the core uh, uh, sense of the consortium? I think that's your plan. Uh, would be the establishment of this kind of dialogue platform for a non-violent uh, solution to the conflict. Would be the consortium willing to join in here? Yeah, uh, we are not for any violent reaction. We are, if you read our communicate, it states that because of this, that and that, mm -hmm. we have decided that should we find the administration behaving in a particular way, all we do is we work out. We are not going to report it as simple as that. We are not going on the streets, we are doing nothing for it. No. All this, we have resolved that so long as the rights of journalists are going to be tempered in the Southwest region, henceforth, we are going to behave um, in a non violent manner, but we are giving blackout to certain uh, events, and that's it. Would we all, but just to uh, push you a little bit, okay. would we also the consortium willing to act proactively and coordinated with other? stakeholders or uh, society agents. It goes without saying that uh, the core press the fourth district, we are part of the overall structure of every community. There is administration, there is the educational stakeholders, we have the lawyers, we have communication. Because we must understand that all of what is happening without communication, it goes nowhere. So we are very willing, we are very open to be part of any platform that seeks to to look for a way out of the current situation. Okay, I think that's already an offer. We will afterwards in the working session definitely discuss a little bit deeper how collaboration, how dialogue can look like uh, between different uh, areas in the in, in the society, I think. But just maybe to have one also a, a, a big, big player in, in the Cameroonian society from my perspective is definitely also the church. Here. And I know that the PCC also uh, is, uh, has an idea of what, what can the PCC or the church do in this current conflict. So what do you think, also from, maybe from the media perspective, but generally what can be the part of a church in this kind of dialogue platform, Reverend? May I start by stating what, uh, how the church has been involved so far? Uh, if, when the conflict started, it started at the heart of the CIMAP meeting. The CIMAP is the highest decision-making body of the PCC. It was during the CIMAP meeting in Bamenda. We had the, oh, the CIMAP committee on the 19th, CIMAP opening service on the 20th. And on that 20th, that is when the, the strike for teachers was uh, giving steam. And in the one later sermon in Tamalum, in the presence of the governor, he was really hard on the current situation in the nation, <coughs> delving into the political situation, but also offering the offer of peace for peaceful negotiation and reconciliation in the ongoing issue. The next day, 21st, was Synod meeting, and that is when things escalated in Bamenda. Now, whenever Synod meets, it is a senior's prerogative to address a message to the governor of the region and to the president of the nation. And in the address that was prepared by Synod to the president and to the governor, top of the agenda was the ongoing issue about the lawyers and the teachers, calling on government to address the issue firstly, but also to desist from any use of force. Because the church seriously decried the use of force in the situation in Bamenda against the students in Boya and against the lawyers who were protesting in Bamina and in Boy. 
And we, we hope they agree to disagree with the head of state and that of the governor is the governor. Incidentally, on the day itself of SEMA meeting in Bamenda, the moderator normally is the chairperson of SEMA, but he chaired the meeting window to about 10 a.m. because he was called by the governor for an emergency issue for him to help intervene to restore peace uh, between the government and those on strike. That was the tough day in Bamenda. And the moderator of the PCC and the Archbishop in Bamenda met with the governor. After meeting with the governor, they called for all the union leaders in Bamenda. They met because they said they cannot be the union leaders in the presence of the governor because he will stifle the openness of discussion. So just the bishop and the moderator met with the union leaders in Bamenda. They had a lengthy discussion where they tabled all their grievances. Now the moderator and the bishop took the leaders of the union to the governor was with the Zidane Major. And they are the ones who presented the grievances of the union leaders to the government, through the governor. So that day they were there from 10 a.m. to about 7 p.m. struggling to get the headway. But now the governor cannot decide on that of the government. All he can do is transmit information to the government. That's how the statement continued. When we came back, the moderator again addressed an official letter to the head of state, indicating the position of the PCC and also offering the good offices of the church for negotiation and dialogue. I think at any point of time, they need the church to intervene in negotiating and dialogue. The church is open to play that role, but still insisting on uh, the government to desist from the use of force and any form of violence. And so, President, that's where we are. But the church is, and from then till now, all the moderator's messages is making me on the whole situation. And so I think the church is quite concerned and something is being done by a few of that. But even actually the Roman Catholics are doing something, the Baptists, and other churches are also doing something. I think we will, we will have afterwards, I already see that there are some minds going on and I think there will be a lot of comments afterwards. Mm -hmm. But I just want to, because we have here such uh, uh, free, free uh, uh, agents of the society, the, the journalism uh, aspect, the civil society, and also one uh, representative of one church, but we have also other uh, persons here in the audience. I think just uh, there is an openness to work together against uh, injustice, brutality on the different levels. Uh, so I just want to see what, what maybe are, and that's maybe one of my last questions before we maybe open the floor is, and I want to start with Orfram, what may be preconditions for such a collaboration? Can you think of uh, any, any kind of preconditions we need for this kind of platform? Um, can I first add something to your last question yeah. what I, uh, I forgot to say before? It's about uh, a party withdrawing. So it's um, from, from dialogue. Right? I'm not wanting to to um, to take part in any further negotiation. Uh, we were talking about uh, non-violent resistance, non-violent action um, as one one uh, method to bring the parties back on the table. And the other one is uh, again to look at the role of the journalists who can actually play a mediating part in, in uh, fostering communication, in uh, generating alternative actions to violent conflict. So, but this needs a certain skill, and that is where conflict transformation also comes in. And that is why we, um, why conflict prevention actually is uh, one of the uh, important um, words here to say we, we, we have to uh, to, to equip journalists with, a, with certain skills in order to um, be able to de-escalate a, a conflict situation. So you would say it's order to true. mediate between two parties. Okay. So you would say from the journalistic part, one precondition is actually being aware how a conflict is structured, how to also answer or reflect this, this analyze uh, this this uh, kind of uh, situation. Do you think of any other uh, preconditions? Because the precondition you are uh, talking about um, preventive. Preventive on the one side, but now in the current situation, we are already in a kind of a tense situation of yeah. conflict at the moment. It's, maybe we can call it Christmas peace somehow. 
but I think there is an openness on the podium, on the panel, for a dialogue platform, for a collaboration, for dialogue, to working together. What are maybe the preconditions uh, for this kind of dialogue platform to thrive, in a sense, uh, from a conflict transformation perspective? Maybe one would be to do a training together, to be on the same level. Mm -hmm. Do you, maybe you can think of anything else? First of all, we all sh uh, should be aware of that uh, media projects alone are not sufficient to um, de-escalate the conflict. So it always needs to work together with Civil, with the civil society. The other way around is the same thing, a civil society project which uh, is uh, conflict de-escalating or conflict preventing is um, also uh, not sufficient without a, a, a media strategy. So um, to reach everybody who is actually involved in the, in the conflict. Um, uh, second thing, sure it is that we all need a certain level of knowledge about how the conflict escalates. Um, what is actually violence? It's not what we just see on the streets. People beating each other, but there's also structural forms of violence, cultural forms of violence. A journalist needs to know about language, how, um, how language can influence um, the stages of, uh, of escalation. We should also be uh, aware of, um, of different stages of escalation, so, uh, and, and maybe also uh, basic things about conflict analysis. If I report about a conflict, um, if I sit down and write something, uh, whatever it is, or make a piece on the radio, I should be aware at least of, uh, of, of analyzing the conflict a little bit of, uh, for myself before I go to the public with it. So I think it's, it's uh, extremely important for journalists to have a basic knowledge of, of conflict transformation. That is also where the civil society organizations or the churches can work together um, with, with journalists. Eh? I think it's now, I just want to have this as a, as, a, as a closing statement somehow. You as a representative of the civil society, if you can imagine this, what would be for you a precondition to establish a broader collaboration with media organs, with churches, or even with other uh, uh, parts of the society you can think Because uh, before uh, concluding on that, from my part, I will say that, uh, let me give one example of what happened recently. I received an SMS from one big chief which was saying that uh, it is time they want to have a kind of platform where uh, they will have the Jews, the elites, they will have uh, the MPs, senators, where they will have um, all the names. And uh, when I look at that, I took a deep breath and I said, either we are not serious or maybe we are not informed. We don't know how to go about it. I wasn't here when they went about that. And the next thing I remember is that I wrote back to the church and I said, where is media? Where are the churches and where is civil society in all of this? And the next SMS I received, I still have it. The next SMS I received was, oh, go, sorry, oh, we forgot. And I said, okay, don't forget again. Because it should be an inclusive dialogue platform where each group beings will express themselves in the way that we want to see resolve this conflict because we are already in a conflict situation. How we will have it resolved. And the next moment, and I said, remember, from this, then they said, give names of civil society. And uh, when I was given an answer, I said, no, wait. I'm withdrawing this name because they are not vocal, because we need people that we talk. The next moment I heard through another SMS that please, we have a rethink the day after we have a rethink. Uh, it will not be like that again because uh, what about some of us who are there to defend party policies? We are seeing that there will be conflict of interest. And I said, by the way, you initiate it. Now, when we talk about preconditions, I will say that most of us are not educated. We are not well informed on conflict resolutions and peace processes. And I think that 
we will need someone to take the lead, you know, to bring in people on board and try to educate people on what it takes to bring people back to the initial, initial stage of where we were. And for this to be done, it could only be done in forums, seminars, or training sessions, where we will train uh, uh, kids, stakeholders, on um, how to go about resolving conflict or how to go about establishing uh, peace processes. For me, I think this is what we need to do. And we also need to train the journalists, not only the journalists, but even other civil society actors on how to monitor and evaluate in, in cases of conflict, how to document, how to denounce, how to report, you know, how to advocate. These are some of the issues which uh, some of us are not well knowledgeable in. And uh, I think that if we have these skills built, it will go a long way in shaping the agenda of the discourse of uh, a conflict resolution and peace building in our country. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Maybe, um, Mr. Kuhn, from the perspective of the consortium, what are kind of preconditions uh, where for the consortium to establish this kind of dialogue but We must understand that a consortium of journalists, uh, primarily we identify us, the journalists, but in the context in which we find ourselves, we are supposed to play to an extent a neutral role. We come in to relay the facts of both the agreed and uh, the government position. Remember in our, our presentation, we said that we give opportunity on our respective media outlets for those, the teachers, the lawyers, to express themselves. And then I may mention the fact that everything that the government is doing equally, we are also giving them expression opportunities on our respective media outlets. Now, should we come into a broad-based uh, platform where we have civil society uh, organizations, the church, the government, lawyers and teachers. I think our role is to tell them that our respective media outlets are available to give expression to all the parties that are, that are involved. That is our role. But a precondition to every other person who should be wanting to be part of a platform that really wants to bring peace in our present situation should be to be ready to make a concession because everybody has a position before coming into a dialogue table or a negotiation table. You cannot come with 10, uh, the target of 10 and leave with the, the target of 10. You must be ready to drop even three and go away with seven. The same way, or that. so I feel a precondition to all the parties that we want to take part in a platform of solution is the readiness to make concession. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I also want to just to ask you. I also read that you are planning to organize a whole anglophone journalist conference in January. Am I right? Yes, we are working towards that. No more information. <laughs> We are already from the time we are really late. No, we, we will have to comment, etc. But I just want to have as a final uh, <laughs> statement. Well, from the church perspective, as, as one church, uh, what are the three conditions you see in the current situation to establish this kind of dialogue platform? Firstly, I think there should be the openness and willingness of all parties to get engaged in dialogue. Because without that willingness, there can never be dialogue. So if all the party, parties concerned can, can actively engage their commitment to dialogue, that would be a positive precondition. Also, they need a safe place for dialogue. Because it needs to be an environment where everybody feels free to air his or her opinion and will not feel victimized after saying what the person has said. So the place matters, and a, a free space where you not feel you'll be arrested after you have said what you need to say. And I think that's one of the things for which the, the union leaders insisted for them to be in Bamenda or in Boya, because to them it was a safe place for them. So we need a safe place, 
and, and, and the church, church is offering that, that safe place presently. Uh, I think most of the churches are offering the same safe place. That if the, the, the government and the, uh, the, civil, the civil society, the unionists feel like comfortable in that environment, this place is available. But, but, but also, as well as I mentioned, the willingness in the dialogue process to be able to trust the one who is, if it's a mediation, the mediator. That we, because the, the mediator should be somebody who is trusted by all the parties concerned. Without which, you would feel that this person is supporting the other side and not the other side. But if, if the church can stand out to play that neutral role and that neutral position to bring the parties together around the dialogue table, I think the church is willing to do that. Okay. At this point, I will just really, really thank uh, our panelists at this uh, point because we have already uh, some time constraints. But please, uh, let us give them a hand of appreciation. For the uh, thank you very much, everybody. And I think we will now go to open the floor for questions and comments. And just as I already said, uh, Brother Simfried, maybe. Uh, could you come in front, maybe also uh, talking a little bit from your perspective as journalist, but also as the head of the uh, communication, Catholic communication service, uh, what can the church contribute? Uh, or what are the preconditions in this kind of dialogue? Platform? Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, and I want to appreciate the wonderful contribution of the people at the, the, uh, the facilitators. I want to start, first of all, by saying that every, every society or culture produces its own kind of journalism and kind of journalism. And uh, journalism has its own role to play. Because when I was into the contribution we have made, we have said that Journalism has a very crucial role to play. It's crucial, but it's just not the all-powerful effects of journalism which existed in the 1980s. We have moved away from the all-powerful effects, but sometimes we should not speak as if we are giving the authorities so much power on journalism. They can only play their own role, and journalists are not policymakers, neither are they politicians. They only have a role to push the policy makers to take the correct policy which they are supposed to make to solve the problem. And uh, as we are seeing, when you look at Johan Galton with his normative concept of peace journalism, it's coming from a perspective and a context that is very democratic and everybody understands his or own role. The government is rule, their own rule, and the civil society, the legislative and all that. But we are trying to implement or interpret or put this concept, this normative concept in a context that is very, very complex. And uh, peace journalism, as we are saying, if you look at it critically, is already teaching us towards an interpretation that is bringing peace. Because the concept of peace journalism are actually, they deviate from real journalistic principles that they move us to ask what will be the effect of the information I'm sending to the public. But in the institution that we have now, we should start by defining who has the responsibility to solve the problem. When we know who has that responsibility, our own role, keeping the traditional values of journalism with its objectivity, uh, balanced reporting, accuracy, and fairness, will be to influence those who have the responsibility to solve the problem to play their own role. And that is what I think we should really define in every community who has the responsibility of solving this problem. And it is the government. And our own journalistic practice should be to influence the government to do what they're supposed to do. Now, on the perspective of the church, when this issue started, the bishops of the Ecclesiastical Province of Bermuda they sent out a letter which was not well received because the society and the culture did not accept that kind of message. They wanted to hear a different language. And that is why later on, you had another letter that was published by the Episcopal Conference of Cameroon in Yaoundé, which was signed by the President of the Bishop Conference. And that one 
was kind of somehow accepted. And then we had a letter that was also written by the Archbishop of Bermuda concerning the issues. And like uh, Reverend was saying, a weak player on rule, being objective, being accurate, giving the facts that are there, we will be gradual and defining who has to solve the problem. We will see that we can lead to a solution to this problem. But if we are only, you know, because we want to apply the principles of peace journalism, we apply it and know who we want to influence to solve the problem. Because if not that, then we may not get where we want to get to. In January, the, the bishops of Cameroon will be meeting all the bishops in Mafe from the seventies, and one of the issues they will discuss very seriously will be the crisis in the country. And after that, they will have a statement that is indicating that there are a lot of mediating factors. Other society uh, uh, policy makers, those who contribute, the civil society, the church, and all that, contributing, and journalism is contributing its own part. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I think you will keep us up to date and posted on what is coming out after the 7th. Uh, just have uh, the representative of the Muslim community, maybe also has a comment here. Yes, comment. Mm. Thank you very much. In this direction, I want to say that, as the Reverend has said, the church has been doing a great role, even when there is no conflict. Because peace is very, very important. When there is conflict, it is just some kind of thing that God wants to test us and see what we as the clergy people can do to resolve. As a result of this, the Muslim community is doing a lot of uh, putting in place a lot of strategies. Uh, like last week we had a meeting, the Imam sent out a communicate to all the Muslim the, the Imams of the region to every Friday to prepare their sermon based on peace and love. So if this is transmitted to the masses, the church are the people who have direct contact with the masses, maybe on a daily basis or more on a daily basis. And the consultation is going on for this demand to send in their contribution so that uh, we can make some proposals and send them to the government.